Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for your patience. Welcome to the Institute for Policy Studies and our panel woke black resistance to US and foreign policy. My name is Nia. I work here as a program associate with the Black Worker Initiative. And I'm also a community organizer with the Black Worker Center in 1DC. Uh, so just to give you a little framing for this panel with all these great folks here. Uh, we're going to be talking about the black radical tradition and resistance and how we break down systems that are oppressive, uh, be it working for race, class, economic, or gender justice. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about what that means domestically as well as for foreign policy and what that means in this current moment um, in time. But to open this up, we have a poet, uh, Ife Aldin, who will come up. And I will just read you a little bit about her. Ife Algen is a DC native. She graduated from Benjamin Banneker Academic High School in 2012 and just recently earned her Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Bowie State University. During her time there, Ife was inducted into three prestigious honor societies, as well as the National Society of Leadership and Success. Ife has been writing since she was seven years old and was inspired by her dad, who is a very well-known and active poet at the time. Ife has performed her poetry at her alma mater, Bowie State University, many times, and she also had the honor of performing at Split This Rock protest rally, Poem Bomb the DOJ in January 2015. So please, can we welcome Ife out. They made out the inner me to be my worst enemy. But I refuse to absorb or exert that energy. I absorb the sun breeze, strengthening my melanin, attempting to secure the correct connections and disconnect myself from these technological weapons. I want to be unplugged. Laptop closed, iPhone free, black out, eyelids resting over my eyes. I don't want to see anything because everything's better in black. And I will not attach a social media hashtag, sorry, not sorry. I am not sorry. I don't want to apologize for breathing anymore, attempting to do it more quietly than the people around me. I am black. I will not step lightly anymore to tongue around subjects that make people uncomfortable. I want to make society prefer uncomfortability over being uninformed. I want to inform you of the government's push to try to discredit facts by anything conspiracy theories, and I want you to hear me. I am a black poet. Writing lines that intertwine like mine and my melanin and rich lover's legs. Lines that sow the symmetry in our black souls. Not black from our nourishment, but just that deep. In knowledge of our history, this thing could speak from our poets. I am a black graduate. Disproving stereotypes and false statistics with my innate intelligence. I didn't fall in the trap. I'm not in love with these streets. I'm leaving my city, but I will not pity the people who fall victim to her. I said, it's a trap. But I refuse to be a victim of this system. I refuse to be a victim of myself. They do see my melanin and they do hate me because whether they say it or not, they know my history too. So I'm widening my consciousness, preparing for a revolution and the end of the effects of a historic diaspora. Um, and preparing for the end of the effects of a historic diaspora. I'm tired of living out the of the living out a seemingly a seemingly ages for the next speech. I am black. I am a black poet. I am a black graduate. I am awake. All right, I am going, thanks, that was really great. I will be introducing the panelists and then they will be presenting in the order that I introduce them. Uh, so I'll start first with Mark Bayard. Mark Bayard is an associate fellow and the director of the Institute for Policy Studies Black Worker Initiative. He was the founding executive director of the Worker Institute at Cornell University. He is a leading expert on racial equity and organizing strategies with extensive experience in building partnerships between labor, faith groups, and civil rights communities. A frequent speaker and social commentator for a number of institutions and organizations, Mark's dedication to achieving just and humane treatment for workers worldwide 
is grounded in his firsthand work and experiences in nearly 50 countries. From 2003 to 2011, he was the Africa Regional Program Director for the AFL-CIO and was recently a fellow with the Kalmanet Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor at Georgetown University. Mark holds master's degrees from Cornell University and Georgetown University and is a highly regarded scholar of labor politics. He is the author of the forthcoming biography, Standing Together in Service, William Lucy, Civil Rights, and the American Labor Movement. Thank you. Lucia Cabona Clark is an assistant professor of African Studies at Howard University. Originally from Tanzania, Dr. Clark is an activist who organizes around black immigrant rights in the U.S. and movements for black lives in the U.S. and Africa. She has a PhD in African Studies and her work focuses on cultural representations and African migration. Her recent publications have focused on hip hop in Africa, specifically hip hop culture's intersection with social change, gender, and politics in Africa. Dr. Clark is also the host of the Hip Hop African blog and podcast and has a book coming out next spring titled Hip Hop and Representation in Africa, Prophets of the City and Dusty Foot Philosophers. Welcome. <laughs> Charo Mina Rojas is a human rights activist, the national coordinator of advocacy and outreach for the Black Communities Process, Proceso de Comunidades Negras, and is a member of the Ethnic Commission and member of Afro-Colombian Solidarity Network based in the United States. In 1995, she worked in the Ministry of Education as inter-institutional advisor for the implementation of a regional project to improve education standards and introduced ethno-education in schools where the Afro-Colombian population was dominant. Mrs. Mina Rojas also worked for many years educating and assisting grassroots Afro-descendant communities on the process of implementing the Law 70 of 1993 that recognizes cultural, territorial, and political rights and defined mechanisms for economic and cultural development of these communities in Colombia. Ajamu Baraka is a former IPS associate fellow and current national organizer of the Black Alliance for Peace. From 2004 to 2011, Baraka served as the founding executive director of the U.S. Human Rights Network, a national network that grew to over 300 U.S.-based organizations and 1,500 individual members. Ajamu has served on the boards of several human rights organizations, including Amnesty International, the Center for Constitutional Rights, and Africa Action. In 2008, Ajamu worked with the U.S. Rights Network, uh, U.S. Human Rights Network, and over 400 organizations to develop a shadow report to the United Nations Commis Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Ajamu was also the Green Party's nominee for Vice President of the United States in the 2016 election. In September 2016, a Morgan County, North Dakota judge issued an arrest warrant against Baraka and Jill Stein after the two were charged with misdemeanor criminal trespassing and criminal mischief in connection with their protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Baraka had spray painted the, world, the word decolonization on a bulldozer during the protest. In an interview shortly afterward, Baraka said that he and Stein were in discussions with our legal team about how we're going to deal with this and described his action as an act of resistance against corporate America and the colonial state. Welcome. Okay, great. Uh, so starting with Mark, if you could summarize the Black Radical <clears throat> tradition and then also talk more about the work that you do with the Black Worker Initiative. Sure. So that's a that's a big order for a five to seven minutes. <laughs> so, well, you can do it exactly. So I will I will do my best. Um, you know, in thinking about the uh, sort of resistance and, and black radical tradition, both domestic and internationally, um, a couple of words you know came to mind, um, and these are some of the themes that I try to use in the work that I do um, here at IPS uh, with the Black Worker Initiative. Um, and it's really about just the amazing um, innovation uh, that, that Black people have always had to have and continue to have in terms of dealing with the ever-changing 
uh, domestic and global economy. Um, it, it, with so many things going on all of the time and things happening at such a rapid pace, it's just amazing the amount of creativity, um, innovation, and the second word is renewal um, that uh, African Americans and Af people of African descent have had to have to uh, both survive, thrive, and succeed. Um, so the two words for me around innovation and renewal are really uh, the core of of what I think about when I think about the work that I try to do with the, my, the, sm the small work I try to do with the Black Worker Initiative um, here at the Institute for Policy Studies. The initiative comes out of the fact that uh, both the labor and civil rights movement in the United States um, are definitely, you know, have been on the decline. And part of that is based upon so many of the limitations, structural limitations, laws, histories that have, um, you know, really, um, weighed down these two um, incredibly important movements uh, for black people. And so in our, in our small way, what we try to do here um, with the Black Worker Initiative is to try to look at incredibly new, ideally incredibly new and innovative ways to promote uh, both the labor and civil rights movement by looking at um, creative ideas that are happening on the ground. I mean, that's really where the ideas come from. Um, and so starting with the grassroots as a perspective it really does shape the way we look at ideas and policies and programs. So not starting with DC as the center, but realizing that most of my work takes me to uh, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, Alabama, North Carolina, um, where there are so many pockets of black resistance uh, taking on you know, multinational corporations, taking on arcane, um, laws that are, that are, that are still um, remnants of, of slavery. With all of those things, you know, there's still a need for, again, the amazing innovation that, uh, that Black people have always had um, and the need to, you know, constantly renew the battles and, and the challenges. So I'm going to try to give you two real concrete examples um, because I think that that really helps tie this work together. Um, last week, we held actually at Howard University a conference called the State of Black Workers in America. And at that conference, we highlighted two particular projects that, um, that, that the Black Worker Initiative is uh, proud to be a part of. One is working with the uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance um, and their innovative project called We Dream in Black, which focuses in on uh, black female domestic workers. Uh, our focus is particularly in the South, so we're looking at Atlanta and we're looking at the Raleigh-Durham area. And the reason we look at domestic workers, um, it, there's a number of reasons. Uh, partially to think about it as a canary in the coal mine, uh, what's happening to domestic workers um, on the front lines of, of, of this economy um, could happen to any of us, no matter what kind of work that we have. But if you look at the historical legacies of domestic work and how and why uh, domestic workers were denied Social Security in the 1930s, it all stems to racism. The two major areas of workers that were denied Social Security were domestic workers and agricultural workers, all who, who were at that time had been black workers. Um, so fast forward literally almost 100 years later, and you see the, you continue to see the ramifications of that. And so by working with the domestic workers today and challenging, you know, Hollywood images of the help or, or, uh, or, or Mammy from Gone with the Wind, you see an amazingly powerful group of women workers who are demanding change, uh, demanding change under the, some of the most difficult situations, conservative um, governors, states that have very small unionization, um, states that don't have um, strong progressive forces, uh, but, they, they, but they want domestic, they want rights, they want to create domestic worker bill of rights, the same things that have happened in places like California and Massachusetts and Illinois, but we're trying to do this in uh, Georgia and in North Carolina. Um, and the amount of energy, excitement, zeal uh, that comes out of these women uh, as they tell their stories and realize by telling their stories, they can actually move from beyond being just hidden figures to being on, on the front lines of, of change. It's a very exciting thing to be a part of. It's a very exciting thing to document, both in terms of photography, in terms of documenting their stories, and realizing that we can use these stories as really powerful public policy tools. Um, so I can definitely talk about that more in, in the future, but that's sort of the kind of innovation that we, we try to do with the Black Worker Initiative. We start with the grassroots and we really figure out ways to magnify, amplify, and project 
those voices um, as far and as wide as possible, with not just the goal of telling amazing stories, but with the goal of actually moving uh, public policy and social policy. Um, if I have, well, I'm gonna, have a few more seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, I'll, I'll really talk briefly about um, another project that uh, I'm starting to work on in Mississippi and Alabama. There's been a huge influx, and this ties into the global piece. There's been a huge influx of German um, corporations into the Deep South. Um, places like South Carolina have close to 300 German firms, and the states of Mississippi and Alabama have anywhere between 20 to 80 in their states. And these companies are locating in some of the most uh, historic civil rights uh, locations, Montgomery, Selma, Birmingham. Um, but what we're finding is that they're coming in with uh, a German, they, in Germany, you have strong unions, strong, uh, strong labor laws, uh, co-determination where labor and management sit and decide policies. But when they come to the United States, all of those things are abandoned. Uh, and what you end up with is a situation that German companies end up acting like American companies. Um, and we're also finding that there is a lack of employment for African Americans in these, these firms. And so by working with uh, organizations like the NAACP and a number of historically black colleges and universities, uh, we are demanding um, a seat at the table. We are demanding um, opportunities, uh, job opportunities, educational opportunities for, for African Americans in these communities. Uh, we just were in Germany two weeks ago meeting with CEOs of a number of German firms saying that you can't come here and abandon all of your amazing principles that you have in Germany uh, and come to the Deep South uh, to, to take advantage of right to work laws, conservative govern, governors, uh, lack of unions, um, and think that that's going to stand. And so that's another innovation that we're doing uh, here at the Black Worker Initiative, where we are directly tackling um, these issues, directly tackling uh, capital and really figuring out ways, uh, not in rhetorical ways, but real concrete ways we can build power for black workers um, in the Deep South. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, so my, when Nessa first asked me to, to speak, he said to um, talk about how yo young organizers have learned from the black radical tradition. And, you know, I, I thought about it and since January, since the inauguration, um, I have been in a headspace where I haven't been able to really kind of dive a lot into acting. It's just feeling like, damn, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it's, haven't been able because it's being an activist is exhausting work it's thankless work it's long hours it's tears it's you know frustration and when you put in work and then the result is our president it can be a real blow um and so i don't even think i've really fully recovered um but one of the things i therefore wanted to talk about are some of the positive lessons that young organizers have, have gotten from the Black radical tradition, but also some of the kind of negative lessons um, that I feel like they haven't really, people have, we haven't learned from. Um, and one is division. Um, there is still too much division among organizations, um, whether they be just, you know, Black only organizations or civil rights, justice organizations, women's organizations. Um, there's division both in the private sphere and in the sphere in the public sphere. And so by publicly, I mean, you have an organization that's progressive and trying to do something. And so because I may not have been invited to speak at their event, I'm going to go online and denounce them as anti-revolutionary. Um, online so everyone can see this battle, um, which only serves to kind of divide the community, to divide the movement. Um, so I see that we still have kind of, we still have taken on that habit, which leads in me into the other issue, um, and that's ego and power. It is extreme, like it's exhausting being an activist, um, and I'm sure some of you have kind of spent long nights um, planning, organizing, mobilizing, making phone calls, text messages, um, making, you know, flyers and banners and all of these things. But the 
individual who gets called to speak the most, the individual who's given the bullhorn the most, the individual who becomes a celebrity um, in the organization, they're always called to do press. It can be very seductive. And it's something that as an individual, you have to fight against. Um, one of the things that a lot of groups are doing now is not having a leader by decentralizing things. But what happens, and that's good, but what still happens is you have a few faces. Um, and I, you know, I, I purposely didn't include some of the organizations I work with. Um, but we have seen in some organizations, certain people become kind of superstars. Um, and when that happens, it's easy to move away from the initial goal and not be as dedicated. And that leads me into money. Um, the easiest way to co-opt the movement is to buy off as leaders. Um, that has always been true. You give somebody, you know, grant money to, to start, you know, whatever, poverty pimps. Um, you give them money and, and give them a position and all of a sudden they're quiet. Um, and you've neutralized this movement because you've taken out some of the leaders or you've thrown money at the movement and by way of grants. Not that grants are bad, um, but when you have to compromise um, your values, they are, absolutely. Um, so, you know, and being an activist doesn't mean you have to take a vow of poverty, but it does mean you probably won't be rich. Um, you can't really be a revolutionary driving a Rolls Royce. I mean, you can't. And it's just contradictory. And so some of us, you know, feel like, well, you know, we can still, I, now I have the money to buy that rules. Let me buy it and still try to act like I'm down for the movement. Um, the other issue is being inflexible. A lot of organizations, and I'm not saying compromising your values, but being unwilling to work with other organizations simply because there are some issues where you may not see eye to eye. So for example, I'm not necessarily, you know, a, a, a socialist, but I've organized with socialist organizations because they were progressive and they were doing things that I felt were positive. Um, rather than saying, well, I'm not a socialist, I'm not gonna organize with socialists, because blah, 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 blah. Um, and I think that's another thing that, uh, that we have inherited, that the young organizers have inherited from the black radical tradition. And as we know, we think about the black radical movement, especially in the 60s and 70s, whether you're talking about in the States or in Africa, um, these are some of the things that, that caused them to fall apart. Um, the other, the unwillingness to, to kind of communicate with other people. Um, sometimes you'll have groups, for example, because they weren't called to the meeting, they'll organize a counter event on the day you're organizing your event. And it's like, why? You know, and that happens a lot. Um, and you will sometimes, you know, call them, oh, but you know, you come to this, you come to this. No, no one called me. And I, what? <laughs> and so you see this and it's frustrating because in the time that we're living in now, it's going to take so much mobilizing to progress and to kind of even gain the things that we've lost in the last know, five, six months, um, even just to get that back. But then to go beyond that, which many of us have been fighting for, we can't have this. And so then it becomes frustrating to see it and to kind of um, witness it day in and day out um, with various organizations. And it's, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I've, um, you know, just kind of been, like I said, frustrated with. Um, there have been some positive things that young activists have learned from the Black radical tradition. Um, and one is the inclusion of groups that were previously marginalized. Um, so you have organizations like Black Lives Matter um, that are very much, um, well, women have a voice in Black Lives Matter, um, but you also have spaces for queer folks. Um, and, and that is something that we didn't see in the, in the Black uh, radical tradition or black nationalist movement, or even in Africa where women helped to fight for independence and then once, you know, countries that are independent, go back into the kitchen. So we're seeing contemporary groups um, kind of attack patriarchy, attack sexism, and attack those that um, seek to promote it, even if it means publicly denouncing someone. Um, 
also the need for black only spaces and being unapologetic about having a black only space whereas before i think there was a lot of sense of you know you know the whole thing of multiculturalism which is very popular in the 80s um and this whole thing of you know people are uncomfortable with saying a black only space because of the politics i won't go into that but um being able to have black only spaces and being able to have allies and saying allies this is what we need you to do and if you're an ally you're truly down for the movement then this is a contribution you will make much of it which involves giving up your privilege um and so i do see that that kind of dialogue is happening okay um also we've learned that yes the government is listening yes there are saboteurs among all of us all of the organizations that we work with have someone who is probably a saboteur or could be potentially one and so we have learned to use encrypted text messaging um to turn off cell phones when we're having meetings um, we have learned a little bit from that, um, but I think in the 70s, they didn't believe that the government cared about um, black radicalism. And we've, I think, learned a lot from that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. Um, I'm okay, I'm gonna take, I will try to do this, do this in seven minutes, but I may take a couple more minutes. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, you all, for being here and for having me here. It's always a, a pleasure and honor to be able to address our issues in front of people that we know that care and has been extremely solidar in solidarity with our struggles. So thank you very much. Um, talking about resistance and, and particularly the walk and resist, uh, I'm just bringing an example of uh, that just happened and here is uh, a document uh, that summarized what happened in, in Buenaventura and I will talk a little bit about that as an example of um, African tradition and, and resistance. I will mention that for us um, part of the African tradition has been always resistance, has been collectiveness, the sense of community, the extended family, the protection, the sustainability, and um, some of the things that um, yeah, mm -hmm. mention and, and elaborate uh, resonate a lot of me thinking in this case of Buenaventura and thinking in our struggle and how we organize and, um, and what are some of our practices in Colombia, particularly with my organization, the Black Communities Process. I'm just going to start very briefly. I'm gonna go really uh, uh, fast on this, but I like to um, always remind uh, people, even if you know about Colombia, that Colombia is a, a country with 46 million people, and 10 of those 46 million people are black people, right? 26%, although the census in 2005 said that we were, were only 10%, we count ourselves as 26% or more due to different studies and um, research that has been done that we uh, self-recognize ourselves as black people in different backgrounds, right? Uh, Afro-Colombians, um, people from um, Raizales, which are for San Andres in Providencia, the ones in the, in the, in the Cartagena, um, Palenque people, but we are black people and we are 26 percent, third of the largest population in, in the Americas. Uh, we are located mostly in this area brown here, where we also have collective titles, and I will mention that later, collective titles um, in those areas. That's the majority of the population located there, but we are all over the country in different communities, different sites of communities, different sites of presence, and uh, active and organized and politicized present. Um, come past. We have a leg legal framework. One of those is the law 70 signed in 1993 that allowed us to recognize us in our ancestral territories to be collectively titled. And collective title is for us very important because it's a way to um, protect uh, the, the territories from what 
is one of our, the, our major challenges and is the economic interests that are located on those territories. Um, we also have through Law 70, the, the territorial authorities, the community councils, which, which are our autonomous territory, uh, authorities on those territories. We, uh, the community councils have the responsibility for the admi environmental administration and care of the territories and have to build uh, um, protective plans, or we call it planes de vida, like life plans that help us to protect and continue the sustainability and the environmental protection of the territory. Uh, so we have uh, 6.5, six, over 6 million hectares of, of land titled collectively. I believe it's around 40 million acres of land and those mostly in those areas. And we have uh, more than 120 community councils of these local authorities, ethnical authorities. A series of international uh, legal framework also that we uh, seek to it, particularly, particularly the ILO 169, that allow us to demand the free prior consultation and consent, which means that whatever is going to be dictated, done in our territories has to pass through a process of consultation with the communities and these local authorities, our autonomous authorities, and has to be a consent to do these things in the territories. And this is a framework that we also use to create protection and, and help us to protect and prevent uh, certain uh, uh, policies, economic policies mostly, and, and large scale projects in the territories. And you can keep on. Uh, the roots of violence, I, I, I will summarize this on racism and the economic interests that are in the territories. Those are the main elements of, of um, the violence and the reasons for violence in Colombia. The internal armed conflict in Colombia has these roots in the, in, in the economic interests, the neoliberal policies, the open up to neoliberalism in Colombia and the res racism that exists uh, there that is not recognized. Um, and here is um, one of the main and the center of the, the issues that uh, has brought uh, Buenaventura, if this is that, um, that has brought Buenaventura to the 22 day strike I will mention in a, in a minute. Um, uh, uh, Colombia has 17 uh, free trade agreements signed, one of them with the United States signed in, in 2011. Many of you helped us to do a very heavy um, activism against the, the, the signing of that free trade agreement. It was signed anyway by President Obama after he, in his campaign he said that he won't. But uh, that has brought to this particular area in Colombia, Buenaventura, which was a minor port and now is the most important port in the region, has brought a tremendous amount of violence in, in, in the country against black people, in this area against black people. Uh, this is an area, this is a, a port with 500,000 people, uh, that's right, 500,000? Mm -hmm. me, right? Yeah. <laughs> 500,000 uh, people, mostly black, 90% of the population in Buenaventura is black. Uh, it's, as I say, the most important port on the region is the center of the development and the uh, pathway for the development of the 17 free trade agreements that Colombia has signed already. And therefore, there are 17 really large scale development projects, and that a small area, particularly two of them for the expansion of the port and the development of tourist um, a project that is going to displace, is forcing to displace uh, seven neighborhoods, um, uh, several thousand um, people from and the gentrification of, of the main area, the central area of the, of the port. And um, 80% of this territory is compromised with these large scale uh, projects. Um, here is the, the difference between, you know, in the, the systemic violence rooted in 
Profit Against Human Rights. Uh, Buenaventura is considered um, a, the, the new capital of horror, is how BBC called it in 2014, after discovering that in Buenaventura there were the so-called shopping houses, uh, casas de pique, places where paramilitary groups and armed groups would bring people alive and cut them in pieces. Uh, most of these people were community leaders and people that were opposed to the development that the government was bringing to Buenaventura. Uh, uh, it has been badly counted that over 167,000 people have been internally displaced in this process in, in that area, and over 7,000 uh, people um, 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 is not well counted, obviously, has been killed violently uh, dead uh, since 2000. But the, what uh, the government presents is the money and the, and the wealth that developing Buenaventura is going to bring to the community, meaning this is no black community. There's no the black people in this community who is going to, to receive these benefits, right? 70% of the imports in Colombia pass through Buenaventura. Seven, over seven billion dollars per year are produced through this activity for activity in Buenaventura. Only three percent, less than three percent, goes back to Buenaventura and is not necessarily for water, for health, for roads, for education of the people. This on which people was on a strike for 22 days. And finally um, comes the strike, and. Um, this was a strike that was very well organized and planned since 2000, for four years, basically. Uh, one initial mobilization happened in 2014. Uh, that mobilization, mobilization led to a, an agreement with the government to provide, uh, to resolve issues of health, of water. Buenaventura is a, is a city that has no water. Uh, people has water only half of the year. This, you know, uh, it's cut, it, uh, cut off com uh, constantly. So people have to collect rainwater. They don't have drinkable water. There are no sewer systems. The only hospital was closed a year ago because corruption. People has two uh, private hospitals that are obviously very expensive and they have to drive three hours to the main city, Cali, to get any medical assistance. Um, so agreements were made for resolving these issues and four years later, the people is in even worse conditions. So they decided this strike, but it was planned for four years. Uh, one of the reasons to don't do it earlier was because when Aventura was completely encroached by these paramilitary and very violent groups. So now they put together this strike with these eight demands, right, about health, education, healthy environment, uh, the respect of the territorial rights, recreation, et cetera. Very peaceful. There are families out there uh, closing the roads, you know, uh, with cultural activities, dancing, singing, the kids playing on the streets, uh, all that. And the response of the government was a very, that's actually a video. Uh, if you click on it, it probably plays. Um, it was a very vicious, violent response. Um, on, on This started on May, May 16th. By May 19, the Special Riot Forces came into Buenaventura. Uh, 3,300 armed uh, groups, you know, between army, military, police, and the Special Riot Forces came into this small town and surrounded and started attacking people with tear gas, with roller, uh, bullet rubber. What bullet? <laughs> Those ones. <laughs> And um, some stuff that they shoot to, to directly that leaves a big sting on mm -hmm. you, but it's very, very painful. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that, and they were attacking, and you can see this is kind of the massive attack that is like all the smoke that is tear gas. But the worst part of this is that they start coming to uh, two, three in the morning, from two or three in the morning to nine in the morning, they will come with these massive attacks by air, although the president has denied it, but there are the videos and the testimonies for that. 
by air and by land with this tear gas, throwing tear gas in the neighborhoods while people was sleeping. So we have over 300, we have already documented over 300 people injured, mostly uh, elder people, um, injured by this tear gas and uh, some of the roller, uh, rubber bullets because when people walk outside, they will shoot, shoot people. Some people were shot actually with real bullets and uh, two people ended up dead in this process. Over 60 children had been severely affected by the gas, the tear gas, uh, with very serious implications considering that there is no uh, health assistance in, in, the, in the town. So everybody had, been had to be rushed to Cali. And but five people finally managed, uh, thanks to the pressure, uh, you saw the amount of people that were on the streets. I mean, every single day after this massive attack, people will go again to the streets in a peaceful way to say we are here and we won't uh, give up until we are here and we reach our agreement. Finally, there was an agreement um, uh, that a part of the agreement, some of the, the, the elements of the agreement are on this, so you, I recommend that you have it and read it, but uh, it, the main uh, agreement is that it's going to be created a specific fund that is going to be managed and uh, uh, monitored by people. So it's not going to be managed by the national authorities, not the local authorities. It's going to be selected people that is going to be managing this fund um, the, the, the people is going to monitor the use of the resources. Um, a development, 10 year development plan is going to be uh, uh, formulated uh, that includes all these uh, demands that they have here in health education. Some what have been prioritized to be responded immediately, like health, like uh, water, for instance, with uh, over 1.5 billion pesos. And um, and uh, people continue to be organized and discussion tables with the authorities as, as how this development plan is going to be put together, how these immediate response are going to be uh, uh, evolving. Uh, they continue on these tables of discussion and negotiation and, and, and formulation of, of plans to develop uh, the, the agreement. So that is an, an strong experience of, of resistance, but also of the wake up of people that were for a really long time um, uh, absorbing all this violence, not only the armed violence by the armed groups, but the state economic violence, which is something that we want to raise up uh, awareness about it, because the most egregious violence in Colombia is not by used by the armed groups as by the state. It's economic and it's armed and it's a criminal action against uh, people, particularly black people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and, uh, and thank all of you for coming out this evening for this very important uh, conversation. I'm gonna make my, my remarks relatively uh, brief so we can get into the uh, Q&A. Um, my comments are going to be very uh, specific, and that is to suggest that when we talk about the black radical tradition, what we are in fact talking about is a revolutionary tradition. What we see here in Colombia is an example of that. That basically, the very fact that we have black people uh, in the Americas is a consequence of a historical process, a, a series of historical events. Uh, beginning with the European invasion of the Americas uh, and the attempt uh, uh, at genocide uh, in, and the enslavement of African people to come to this part of the world uh, that resulted in the creation of what we refer, refer to today uh, as Western Europe. So the black radical tradition is a tradition of opposition, a tradition of struggle is baseline position is that we are committed to radical fundamental change. That we recognize that we are the victims of a vicious colonial capitalist system 
and that the only way that we're going to be able to transform ourselves is by transforming our conditions, by altering the oppressive relationships that we are uh, subjected to. So that baseline position that, no, we are not uh, Americans, that we are basically uh, captives in a settler colonial state is a perspective of the black radical tradition. It is a perspective and a narrative of opposition, but it's also a, a theory of, of change. We have a vision for what we can be as African people, but what we can be as a collective humanity, that what we are subjected to, the kinds of conditions that we, we, we are subjected to, the, the mode of living uh, that they uh, suggest is supposed to be representative of the apex of human development and civilization, uh, we categorically reject that. We say that we can be more than what we are today. And that is the, the, the perspective of, of black revolutionaries. It says that basically we take an uncompromising position in our opposition to this oppressive system. Uh, it confronts the uh, the hegemonic uh, colonial narrative, this notion that uh, the U.S. is some shining city on the hill, that uh, it was some kind of uh, 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 courageous uh, activity on the part of, of European immigrants uh, to come into this country and to shoot and kill and murder themselves across this landmass from the eastern part of this uh, country to uh, the western shores. Uh, we say that there is nothing in that ex experience that uh, uh, props up the U.S. as something uh, exceptional, unless we are talking about the uh, exceptional brutality and violence that's characterized uh, the experience here uh, in this country. So the black radical tradition is one of opposition. Uh, engage in opposition in its various forms as we look at the evolution of this country and the various forms of oppression uh, and structural uh, oppression we have here in this country. Um, the tradition, though, became more crystallized uh, in terms of its ideological expressions, probably in the, at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. Uh, when we had the emergence of the Pan-African movement, um, one important element of the black radical tradition is that uh, we did not engage in any kind of U.S. centrism. Uh, that is, we recognized that we were part of a, uh, a people and that um, our, that recognition said that we are connected fundamentally not only in terms of, of, of our potential connection to one another in various parts of the world because of the racial construction of us being black people or, or African people, uh, but that we had a common enemy in that we were exposed to a common process. So when African people ended up in the Caribbean, when African people ended up throughout uh, South America, uh, we recognized that we were part of one process and therefore uh, part of our position, part of our approach to struggle was one in which we saw that we had to be in an intimate and fundamental solidarity with African people throughout the Americas and African people uh, during the anti-colonial period on the continent. In the process of that recognition, uh, we developed uh, theory. Uh, we uh, embrace some of the most advanced elements of the uh, oppositional theories that were uh, predominant uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, we had uh, uh, black radicals that uh, um, provided a foundation to these recognitions we had among ourselves as oppressed people. Um, those uh, formulations would manifest themselves in various kinds of struggles uh, culminating uh, with the Black Liberation Movement in the 1960s and the 1970s. 
uh, where we engage in um, uh, oppositional uh, struggles uh, and oppositional fight uh, to attempt to realize that objective of revolutionary change here uh, in this country. Uh, we know that the Black uh, Liberation Movement was targeted, subjected to a very intense uh, counterinsurgency uh, with the um, objective to not only wipe us out militarily, but to eliminate us ideologically, to ensure that another generation of opposition would not emerge here uh, in this country. So you find that when you take a look at the targeting of the uh, Black radical tradition uh, and the Black liberation movement as this uh, political expression, uh, that uh, it was not only military, mil mil military uh, uh, targeting, but also it had as its main objective uh, to create uh, a new uh, uh, black person, the Americanization, if you will, of the African here in this country. Fast forward to the 1970s um, and the 1980s, and you had the emergence uh, of neoliberalism uh, that had a devastating impact on black people, African people in this country. Uh, Mark talked about the fact that you have with this neoliberal uh, globalization, you have now the uh, influx of European capital into the, into the South. Uh, you have the offshoring of jobs, uh, the elimination of the U.S. industrial base because of the international uh, production process. Uh, and the consequence of all that has been for Black people, for African people, is that we have now become, in essence, uh, a redundant population, a, uh, a population that's now disposable. Because throughout this period, you know, black labor was always important. It played a role within the economy. I argue that today uh, that no longer exists. And that's why we have the, the dangerous situation that we are facing today. That's why we have the expansion of, of mass incarceration. That's why we have an intensification of the policing and uh, the violence that we have uh, been subjected to coming from uh, from the authorities. So what we have today is the uh, black radical tradition under attack, but also like all social processes, uh, the black radical tradition reemerging because the conditions are such that uh, this system, its ability to perpetuate itself uh, ideologically has been undermined. Uh, it's uh, uh, now uh, uh, dependent on the use of force. Um, and as a consequence, it is now exposing itself, its nature. And as a result of that, more and more people are coming to the conclusion that the only way we're going to be able to uh, advance ourselves, the only way that we're going to be able to live a more humane life is in fact embracing and engaging in a revolutionary process. So the black radical tradition I think stands uh, front and center uh, and ready to provide leadership to that process. Um, and it is a process that we believe uh, will be successful here uh, in this country. All right, so we have about 15 or so minutes left. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for discussion to happen. But also, uh, before we transition, if any of the panelists would like to take this question, I always like to talk about one, action steps that people can take that you recommend, and two, what brings you inspiration and hope uh, in this Black <laughs> radical tradition and your work. So open to any of the panelists who want to answer that, but then also we can open up to the audience for discussion. Did anyone want to take a well, I, I will start mm -hmm. by saying that uh, with all the issues we have to face here in this country, we need to narrow down our focus, our strategic focus to those issues that uh, have the potential of advancing a progressive and radical movement here in this country. And I would suggest that there are two main issues short term. One is the issue of, of, of health care uh, and the uh, argument 
the struggle that many of us are engaged in uh, in terms of fighting for uh, Medicare for all um, legislation. I think that that, that that is something that we can focus in on. And that, it's not saying that there's, there's not other issues. Of course, there are <clears throat> a lot of issues. But that's a contradiction, I think, uh, provides some real traction for uh, building the kind of broad-based movement that we have to build here in this country. The second issue, uh, the issue of, of war and militarism. It is a contradiction that we can exploit because the state is now more dependent on using its military might uh, in order to maintain the hegemony of the oligarchy. Um, so they are prepared to completely gut uh, federal agencies in order to expand the military budget uh, so that they can have the military means to, uh, to perpetuate their dominance. We have to take the opposite position. We've got to oppose the Trump uh, expansion of the military. We've got to expose the expansion of, of U.S. ground forces in the so-called Middle East. Uh, we've got to stand up and stand against uh, the continuation of this 1033 program that allows for the uh, military to transfer arms and equipment to the police to, uh, to militarize the police forces. Um, we've got to stand against the expansion of the military on the African continent through the U.S. Uh, African Command. So I believe that, that black people have uh, an opportunity to, uh, to revive a uh, anti-war, anti-imperialist presence here in this country as part of the effort to revive an anti-war movement. So this notion of, of war and peace, I think, has to be something that we embrace uh, and we center as a, uh, as a fundamental issue that we should uh, raise up and, and fight for. If I may, um, for us, two very important um, elements right now, and I think that a step forward uh, steps to take, uh, are one is to continue building and sustaining community, sense of community, because for us, the building and the sense of community is a sense of belonging, is a sense of place and the, the space where we can really call these struggles as who we are. And, and that's one of the reasons that we defend so strongly the, our presence and our uh, stay on the lands. You know, the, the ancestral lands is not only an economic issue, it's an, it's an issue of survival of the people. And um, one thing that I have seen here in the United States with the so-called economic crisis and all these uh, situations happening here is that the, the destruction of the black communities. And once the black communities are destroyed, then you are, are kind of losing the roots and walking away from those African traditions, from those elements of the African tradition. So continue building a community and sustaining community, I think is something very, very important uh, for every African struggle and anywhere. But the other uh, that is every day more significant for us is how we connect the struggles and start building more transnational, more global agendas mm -hmm. for transnational struggles. We understand that our struggle in Colombia, the black people struggle in Buenaventura, is a struggle that transcends Buenaventura and is a struggle of black people in Colombia. But as we uh, build up in that struggle in Colombia, we understand that that is the struggle of black people in the United States. It's the struggle of every African person in, in, in other parts of the world. And build up uh, common agendas to try to come together and certain, uh, you know, how these struggles connect and how is that we can kind of work together in different places, even being as distant. Uh, is something that we need to be thinking on and, and working on because um, it's, um, it's very hard now to sustain this kind of struggle uh, against these enormous powers just by ourselves. And we know, you know, by the, the experience of all these years um, in Colombia that it's that solidarity from the others that has, has helped us to continue in the struggle but that solidarity needs to transcend to a, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, but it is, it is to understand that 
I am in solidarity with this struggle, not from outside, but because it's my own struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's a different kind of solidarity. That's a reciprocal solidarity where I am part of it. I'm not an outsider, you know, even a black outsider thinking that I'm helping this other that is in, 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 in need, is that I am part of that need. And that's why, because uh, that's why I'm assisting and I'm supporting and I'm struggling with my brother and my sister because this is my family issue, right? So I think that would be two key elements for us uh, at this moment. Um, I would say just kind of echoing that in terms of um, joining an organization and kind of educating yourself. And if you're part of an organization, joining an organization that perhaps um, is aligned with your core values, like, you know, ending the occupation of Palestine and other organizations that we need to form solidarity movements around. Um, and the like second, get a passport. <laughs> and um, that that gives me, that's what keeps me sustained. I mean, I was just um, telling Reese I'm, I'm going back home next week um, for just one week. I just, I need to get, I just need to wait for a week. Um, but getting that passport and engaging with folks on the continent in Latin America, um, it gives you a very different perspective and it globalizes the movement rather than, you know, you, you kind of take it from a local perspective to a global one. Mm -hmm. um, so just the process of just getting that passport, um, I always, always tell folks that's, you know, that's the first step. Um, so that would, Um, I mean, I guess the only thing that I would add is, uh, and I think people touched upon it, is that realizing the definition of community is so much more than uh, the neighborhood or locale that you're that you're located in, and the realization that these uh, you know these global corporations are doing um, very similar things in so many different parts of the world, um, and it's only through some conversations like this and the ability to see it uh, and understand what's going on in other places that uh, you know we can react to it, we can feel some sort of tangible connection um, that can then lead us to get the passport and do the do, do the actual work so it's um it's it's kudos to um people who can come here and tell their story to us and share their story to us and actually try to build that true solidarity so that we can figure out our place uh, and our role uh, in supporting these struggles because definitely the, these struggles are our struggles um, and it's important to be reminded of that every day Okay, now let's uh, take a few questions or comments from the audience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a first comment I wanted to make was about the struggle of the first part of community, because I think it's very in line with the, the concept of community control, which is part of the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter, the movement of Black Lives, and it's in the, the vision statement. And incidentally, unfortunately, that when comes to this event, there's a national uh, webinar that Vision Black Lives is having about community control. Um, oh. So I will hardly uh, use that. Just wanted to bring that together so we see the, the equivalent, the counterpart right here playing out. Um, I have two questions, and they're um, both pretty much for down, but anyone else can can um, chime in if you have something to add. First was, uh, John, you said that um, us as African people uh, recognize that we're part of a process brought us to the Western Hemisphere. So I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, how did that in a way that also looks at Africans, uh, recognizes the, 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 the uh, connectedness of the process that, in, that in, uh, involves other people, other Africans in other places in the world besides the Western Hemisphere, particularly those who might be immigrants who come here and see uh, that still differently. So here, they, uh, so it's not taken for granted that what you're saying is we're only, our only connection is that we're in the Western Hemisphere, but there's also other connections. That's that. I don't know if that's clear enough. The second one is more for other people because is what I get from the radical Black tradition, one of the things, the lesson I think the radical Black tradition has given our movement today that I didn't hear mentioned, maybe I missed it, was real internationalism. It's broadened beyond African people, period. When we talk about the solidarity with Palestinians and other people, when we look at that kind of solidarity, that goes all the way back to the radical tra black tradition. But one thing, if, if I'm accurate in that, which you can maybe provide us with some examples beyond what I just said. 
let me take, let me let me take a jab at the second one first. I, I think that, that was, that's an important uh, question um, and comment because that is a, a fundamental part of the black radical tradition that. It, our solidarity wasn't just with African people, as important as, as that is, but um, we recognize not only the, the, the commonality with the oppressed and colonized African people, but also oppressed and colonized people throughout the, the world. We know that the, uh, the hegemony of, of Europe was, was global, uh, and therefore we recognize that uh, we had and were part of a, a global struggle. So, for example, even with the, pan, the emergence of the Pan-African movement, uh, it was an, an attempt to reach out to other peoples who were just beginning to emerge, who had some degree of ability to communicate with other people outside of their colonial experience. Uh, we know that when the, the Garvey movement that began to develop, uh, that you know, they communicated with people throughout the world. You know, he, they had in their paper, uh, they covered uh, struggles in every part of the world. So that was part of, of developing their international consciousness. Uh, we know that um, that was in, uh, reflected in uh, concrete activities like when the, the, the fight against fascism began to emerge. You had the numbers of black folks who ended up in Spain fighting against uh, 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 Franco and the fascists, you know? That's part of, that's been part of our tradition. So, yeah, that is something that we have to remind ourselves of, in particular, uh, some of our younger folks um, who, who are developing this, this sense of the connectiveness between our struggles here and, uh, and, the, and the globe. That uh, recognition in the uh, movement for Black Lives uh, that talked about uh, Solidarity with Palestine was really, really important. You know, um, that is something we have to uh, re-embrace, if you will. That uh, we and we have to do that because there is a troubling kind of U.S. centrism that's developing um, also. Uh, that is strange. We never had that before, and weird, even to the extent of people attempting to colonize the term "black" mm -hmm. as being something that's reflective and, and owned by. Uh, Negroes in the U.S., you know, I reject that completely. So we've got to, you know, re-embrace these these kinds of concepts that really uh, express the highest uh, expressions of of Black revolutionary thought. Now, on the first piece, I mean, I, I don't want to talk too much, but I think that that uh, again, what we tried to do as part of the emerging Pan African movement was to articulate positions in which we, we said that uh, it was important that black people develop an African awareness, but that African awareness had to be also grounded, though, in a sense of, of, of the system that was creating the Africans that we we're talking about, and that uh, there had to be a certain kind of consciousness that went beyond just being aware of one's Africanness, but also politically want a consciousness that understood that the vast majority of our people were in fact uh, oppressed workers and poor folks and that that understanding had to be the, the foundation of our radical politics in other words uh it wasn't it's not enough just to be an african one has got to take a progressive political position based on the material realities and contradictions of our people the vast majority of our people are working class people, they are poor people, and therefore they have no, no stake, no interest in the continuation of this backward capitalist system. Now that's a position that's going to be somewhat different uh, from the positions taken by elements of the black petty bourgeoisie and the, the, the aspiring black bourgeoisie, which means that you know, in essence, they take positions that are opposed and opposite to, to the masses of our people. Therefore, they have aligned themselves with the enemy. And that has to be made crystal clear. I see one more question up here, but I wanted to check with the room to see if there are any more. We'll take them, say them out loud, and then uh, we'll do another poem to close out this evening. So uh, anyone else who 
potentially has a question or or comment? Okay, so we'll get here and then the three in the back. If you could just say them one by one, and then we'll let the panelists answer them. Well, it's funny because he actually answered the question that I was about to ask. <laughs> My question was, what you call this talk woke. And I heard a lot about the condition. But what do you mean by being woke? What does that mean? And, and now that you are awake, what are you um, going to do about the majority who are asleep? And you answered that. Because some people who are awake are very conscious of the fact that their conduct is counter to you mentioned the, the things that Mr. President Obama, okay, so when I say Mr., so I'm sorry, President Obama did that affected Colombia, but he not only had policies that adversely affected Colombia, he also had policies that affected Africans throughout the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And we need to do something about being woke. So I think you've already responded to that question. But if anybody else wants to also talk about the fact that once you develop this level of consciousness, we, we need to know what to do with it and to understand that just because we're conscious in one area does not necessarily mean we're conscious in another area. And I'd like to comment on that. And let's get the ones in the back also. And one of the comments we were in charge is having seen in back of the league. Uh, while it turned out to be a good talking point for people who knew nothing about the system around us, on the other hand, it raised more questions than it answered for a lot of people that were not addressed, which I understand is not possible within a time frame of this kind of information. It's vast as the country. But I just was wondering from your perspective, uh, if anyone saw it, what you felt about whether the information was thorough enough, accurate enough, um, or if it was gave you a new perspective. That's my perspective to be followed by uh, Dr. Lisa Hilliard and Dr. Adelaide Sermon and all of the scholars at that level. So just a second. Thank you. So a lot of the conversations in here, uh, this uh, jargon is used. There's a theory that's being used. I want to know, like, where do we start achieving people? Like, uh, I can't just grab a copy of Marx's Capital and read it, or grab um, one of Barbie's books. How do we teach theory as far as um, like critical theory is difficult? It's always kept in academic. Thank you. And then maybe so did you have one too? I just wanted to hear about what made it better. Um, I mean, I can go first on a couple of things. I, I did not see the, the, the Gates uh, special, so I, I can't really comment on that. Um, and I thought your point was interesting about how do you bring information to people, um, particularly younger people. I think that, uh, you know, I think the Movement for Black Lives has done a good job in terms of sharing um, a lot of information, uh, sharing a lot of names, um, referencing and footnoting to some extent possible. Um, so in source material, reading material, um, but I think it's hard. I mean, I think, I think, I think the, the reality is that in a culture where, you know, uh, tweets are, uh, you know, the, the norm uh, these days, even at the highest levels, uh, people watch, you know, really short video vine clips. I mean, it's, it is very hard to present um, 
large amounts of information, um, even if you use some of the, you know, the best popular education techniques out there, I mean, these things take time. Um, you know, these things take people patience, these things take community and trust to actually get that, that stuff out. And um, I think it's a lot harder than, than, it, than it has been. It's not impossible, obviously, and it needs to be done. Um, and there are amazing popular educators uh, doing work all across the country. Uh, they don't even call themselves popular educators, but they're use, working in that prayer and tradition. Um, I just think it's harder these days. It might be a little bit harder, um, but it's absolutely necessary. And um, those educators who are usually at the grassroots level are really the folks who transition um, information to, um, I don't want to say the masses, but to the majority of people who do not have the time to sit and read 200, 300 page long books or, you know, spend all the time at the library or even plow through Wikipedia for hours on end. Uh, we need those sort of community communicators and those popular educators. And that's always been a huge part of, of, of the movement, um, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. Um, okay. Um... I, I saw the first episode of the, of the Gates program. Um, they did a screening at uh, WHUT, Howard's TV station, um, and we, there was a panel discussion. And I'm not, you know, an expert on Egypt. Um, actually, Dr. Greg Carr was there. I don't know some of you may know who Greg Carr is. Um, and he really broke down some of the things that were omitted, and some of the things were just inaccurate, and the choice of scholars to put on screen. Um, and so then there was this debate about um, whether or not it can be used as a tool for educating to kind of getting that, that you know, foot in the door. Um, so do we throw it out because it's inaccurate or do we at least kind of say, okay, well, this is a starting point and we can have a discussion about, you know, um, and I, we, you know, the people disagreed. And so there wasn't really kind of, and I, I don't think there is a right or wrong answer um but um yeah so it was definitely interesting um in terms of the black women i'll ask that question um the role of black women in black rap the black radical tradition i think that um black women have always been part of the black radical tradition um and i think during especially in the 50s and 60s and 70s um, there was a conscious decision in Africa and in the U.S. to put race first, to say that we can't stop and have this discussion about patriarchy because that could split the movement. So we're going to put that on the back seat. We recognize it's an issue, but we're going to put it back here and deal with racial solidarity first. And I think now what you're seeing is people saying we can do both um, and saying we're not going to, yeah, we have to do both. Um, attacking patriarchy and like literally shutting it down. Um, in Black Lives Matter, I've seen it over in South Africa with Feeds Must Fall. Those sisters over there are like, woof. I mean, it, it's fierce. Like they will not have it, period. The women who did the um, new protest and then there was a DJ who kind of mocked the women, um, body shamed them. I mean, the, the movement kind of mobilized and went after this guy. Um, and so I think it's there. And I also think that we see a lot, a lot, I don't want to say more, but th there is a lot of Pan-African solidarity in terms of women, in terms of Black feminism, African feminism. Um, you see a lot of it at the scholarly level, but I think even in terms of activism, you see a lot more of, you know, kind of us dealing with racism, us dealing with sexism, us dealing with all these things and kind of coming together. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good day for, <laughs> for black women in the black radical tradition. Um, <laughs> I will add to the, to the uh, uh, role of the um, black woman in the African tradition. I think uh, one very important role that women has played is, is um, systematizing the knowledge, the political knowledge, I, I would put it that way, is it's, it's building up uh, conceptually uh, uh, what in the practice you try to, 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 to do, right? For instance, uh, the, the, the black feminism, right? What brought in, in all the uh, theory, 
the orientation and all the epistemological constructions that women did at the moment uh, contribute significantly to the to the movement and the, the organizing and the political processes, right? So I think that uh, one of the things that we have been, and it happens also in the movement in, in Colombia, is that those that, that knowledge, not only the traditional knowledge, but the political knowledge that builds up in the in the practice, is put in a way that is, is, is formulated and put in a way that um, help to to build theory and build ideology, right? And I think that has been very important role of women uh, in terms of knowledge and in terms of sharing and producing and organizing what is in the practice as something that you can use theoretically and politically to argue to bring the arguments and the and and, and the elements to generate dia political dialogue. Um, I think that once you are you awake, your next step is organize. So because once you organize, you know, it's in that in that area where you find what to do, right? You you, you now know that there is an issue and you now know that you have a, a role to play and the next step is organize and educate. The, the challenge we have now with Buenaventura, for instance, that awakes, you know, not everybody was organized, but everybody was on the streets, very outraged by what has been happening, that people are ready to organize, to be organized and to be lead and continue the organization. So uh, uh, it really excels and subsides in this, in this political struggle. Um, but it needs uh, education. Now, in our experience, um, what is important from uh, the Marxist theory or any other theory is not that people read the whole uh, over hundreds of pages, so, but how that become practical, right? How that applies to their realities. And I think that's easier, a little bit easier, right? And I actually find in our, uh, in our conditions, in our experience uh, where people don't have internet, much access to computers and books and these things, right? The, the social media has become a very useful tool. I'm always uh, very happy to see someone that find an article talking about oppression, talking about, you know, the speech of, uh, of uh, Malcolm X in a certain moment or some, some idea and put it on the WhatsApp group so everybody can read it, right? It's a page, it's a paragraph, it's a couple of pages. Sometimes it's a long thing that you don't want to read in WhatsApp. <laughs> but it is there, right? And sooner or later, you will do something with it or you will read the title and something gets in, in, in you. So I think that an advantage today is that all these huge amounts of pages of theory, theory and, you know, are being more practical to with, as, with short messages to say, you know, what oppression means and, and where that oppression comes from and who are the actors of that oppression and things like that, that bring you to the more practical uh, uh, situation and, and connect that to your own reality. Um, uh, I think that we just need to, to learn more about these opportunities and, and ground, you know, ground, uh, yeah, bring to the ground uh, what we just have up here, right, with those big, you know, theories and things, and just put it down on the, the people, because that's the way that people understand it, right? And we have amazing leaders that don't read or write, and they can't discuss, you know, these theories used by practice. Just they heard the idea, but they apply that to the practice, and they understand, you know, how that works in the reality, and they give you a lecture. So. If I could jump in real quick too, mm -hmm. I, I think what 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 Chato is laying out is is something really really important. Um, I mean, I've seen it in action, and it's something that we've got to get get a little little, little, little bit more serious about here in the U.S. And that is this process of of political education on the grassroots level, because what what we see in uh, Colombia is a um, a commitment to that, but also a recognition that people can learn. That people are people can people people can have agency. People can think for themselves. 
we tend here, we talk about meeting the masses where they are and all this kind of stuff. But usually that turns out to be, you know, BS because we're not really doing real political education. We meet the people where they are and we don't take the people any place. So you come back, you know, two years later and, and, and it's the same level of political uh, development because I think that sometimes the, the class background of the organizers are such where they don't really believe that people can grapple with sophisticated concepts, but they can. I've seen the I've been involved in some of the most sophisticated uh, conversations uh, any place on the planet in Colombia among people who never stepped foot in a college or university setting, okay? Because the organizations take political education seriously and they engage in that. So I think that, you know, the way we move away from things that get defined as jargon to real conceptual frameworks and theoretical frameworks that help people to understand their realities is to begin to, in fact, engage in serious political education, political and uh, uh, collective learning, uh, and believe that, in fact, the in fact people can, in fact, uh, learn things and to struggle against the endemic anti-intellectualism that we have here in this culture. We cannot defeat this enemy without becoming more disciplined, but without developing people who can think for themselves. We need to move away from the great man uh, and deal with this notion of collective leadership. And the way you deal, do that is being, being committed to this notion that all of us are potential leaders, all of us are organizers, but we have to have certain kinds of, of, of tools to be effective organizers. And one of those tools is understanding our realities, understanding the world. And the only way you, you get to that understanding is through that kind of process of collective engagement. We are uh, going to close out with a poem by Ike. But before we do that, I wanna thank all of you and thank the audience for showing up. <laughs>
I mean, these were slave codes. It was purposely built to exclude us. The only real culture in this country is capitalism. And I'm from the nation's capital, which was once the murder capital, but they still murdered the capital. Mm. Calling us gangsters, thugs, and thieves. Like, we're the one who killed and condemned Native Americans to reservations right. after we sold their country. Yes. Like, we're the ones who penetrated the culture. Like, we're the ones who sold the people. Like, we're not the ones who built this country on our back while our women had to lie on their backs. I have to take it back because it's hard to understand the state of this nation without our story. Mm -hmm. This pain has been hanging over our heads for far too long. A really much better story like my brother's with the rope necktie hanging from the forbidden tree. I'm just tired of seeing blood. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ben, and thank you everyone for coming out. Have a great night. And please take a look at that report that we have from the uh, Black Alliance for Peace. And please go to the website, consider joining this process. We're building a, a brand new black anti-war, anti-imperialist, anti-repressive movement here.